northern shores of Hawaii are famous for their world-class wintertime surf. And one of the reasons is because of the good form that the waves take as they pass over the underlying reef. But in the summertime, the waves on the northern shores are flat, and so time is perhaps better spent snorkeling around and getting to know these same reefs. This reef slab that I'm standing on here at Shark's Cove on the north shore of Oahu is exposed because it happens to be at low tide. And every time this occurs, many fish inevitably get trapped in the various pools here on top of this slab. And that's because of the receding waters as well as the evaporation due to heat from the sun. Unfortunately, we cannot help all of these fish today. They will have to wait for the next high tide to come. So let's just hope that they make it that long. But what we can do is study the process of evaporation and also the related processes of vaporization and vapor pressure of water. In our previous lectures, we discussed some important differences between solids, liquids, and gases, as well as what really happens when a solid melts into a liquid and a liquid boils into a gas. Let's recall the main points of that discussion. When a substance is cold enough, we know that it's going to be in the solid phase. And that's because at cold temperatures, particles do not have that much molecular motion, and so they're held locked in position because of the interactions between the particles. Now, as the solid's temperature is raised, the molecular motion of the particles increases, and once the temperature is raised up to the melting temperature, the particles now have sufficient molecular motion to break free from those locking interactions, and the solid melts into a liquid. Now, the interactions between the particles are still holding them close to one another, but at least the particles have the freedom to slide around and move past one another. Now, similarly, as the temperature of the liquid is raised up to the boiling temperature, that molecular motion has now increased to a sufficient level to give the particles enough motion to completely break free and the liquid boils into a gas. So that's a pretty detailed description of the three phases of matter as well as what happens during melting and boiling. But the whole story has not been told because a liquid does not necessarily need to boil in order to convert into the gas phase. And you'll see why by considering the following. Suppose we have a puddle of water sitting on the floor at room temperature. Now we know from experience that if we wait long enough, this puddle will evaporate into the gas phase. So how did that happen? It obviously did not boil. Don't the liquid particles need to be raised up to the boiling temperature to have that sufficient molecular motion to break free from one another and escape into the gas phase? Well, yes and no. Yes, the particles do need sufficient molecular motion to break free from one another, but no, the liquid does not need to be raised up to the boiling temperature in order to do that. So how do we resolve this apparent dilemma? Well, we do that by taking a closer look at heat flow and molecular motion. And that's what this discussion is about today. So let's take a closer look at heat flow. And I think we'll begin to understand how a liquid can evaporate at room temperature. This diagram right here has particles on the left at a hot temperature and particles on the right at a colder temperature. And these particles are separated from one another by a removable barrier. Now, the high temperature particles have more thermal energy on average than the cold particles do. And that simply means they have more molecular motion than the cold particles do. But the key word is average. All of these particles 
aren't necessarily moving around at the same velocity. Just their average molecular speed is higher than what the cold particles are. So let's go ahead and remove this barrier and observe what happens. Removing that barrier will allow heat to transfer from the hot side over to the cold side. And that's the direction that heat always transfers, from hot to cold. You never see energy being transferred in the other direction. It always goes from hot to cold. That's a pretty important point. And we need to understand why that is. Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. These hot particles have more molecular motion, as we now understand. And when they begin to bump into the cold particles, because the barrier has now been removed, they simply bump into the cold particles and cause those cold particles to jostle around a little bit more quickly. And as a result, the hot particles now jostle around a little bit less. Because, you know, when a fast-moving particle bumps into a slow-moving particle, the slow-moving particle increases its speed, and the fast-moving particle decreases its speed. And this will continue until all the particles have met one another, and the temperature ends up pretty even throughout the fluid. So it continues until no more hot or cold zones exist. And the temperature would end up being somewhere in the middle, some warm temperature. Now let's take a closer look at what we mean by average. You see, to better understand particle motion, let's take a closer look at what I like to term the three-dimensional billiard ball game. Suppose we have a container that has a bunch of particles moving around, and the, this group of particles is at a certain temperature. Now, particle motion is kind of like a three-dimensional billiard ball game meaning the particles are basically flying around, bumping into each other, bumping into the walls of the container, and there are fast-moving particles and there are slow-moving particles. They're not all moving around at the same speed. It's exactly the same kind of situation as when you break a bunch of billiard balls on a table. Some of the balls are moving quickly and they bump into some of the balls that are moving slowly, and so speed is transferred between one ball and another. And so through molecular collisions, balls are constantly changing their velocity. At right now, this particle may be moving very quickly, but once it bumps into a slower moving particle, that slower moving particle would increase its speed and the fast moving particle will decrease its speed. But you're still going to have fast-moving particles and slow-moving particles. You see, there's a distribution of molecular speeds in any group of particles. And it doesn't matter what the substance is, whether it is a solid, liquid, or gas. There will always be more fast-moving particles and more slow-moving particles, and then lots of particles that are moving kind of in the middle speed. And this distribution of molecular velocities is called the Boltzmann distribution. Boltzmann distribution describes the velocity distribution among really any group of particles. And it's explained through the following graph. This graph plots the probability versus the particle velocity. And the way you want to read this graph is as follows. There are three temperatures listed here on this graph. Suppose you have a group of particles at 25 degrees Celsius, 50 degrees Celsius, and 100 degrees Celsius. At 25 degrees Celsius, the particles are not moving around as quickly, on average. And this peak represents the average. Now the y-axis is probability, 
And that just means that if you pick a particle at random, what is the probability that it will have a certain speed? Well, you're most probable to find at 25 degrees Celsius the particle having this velocity. Now, if the substance is at a higher temperature, say 100 degrees Celsius, and you pick a particle at random, then you're most likely to find its velocity being more quicker. So at colder temperatures, the likelihood of a particle having a certain velocity will fall down here at slower velocities. And at higher temperatures, the likelihood will be a particle having a faster velocity. Now, that's just the average particle. At any given temperature, you will have particles that are moving more quickly and some that are also moving more slowly. So, even at 25 degrees Celsius, where the average particle velocity is much slower than the average particle velocity at 100 degrees Celsius, you see, even at 25, you do have a few particles that are moving more quickly. And so if you consider that puddle on the floor that's at room temperature, which is 25 degrees Celsius, there are some particles in that puddle that are moving more quickly than the other ones are. And they have sufficient molecular motion to escape the rest of the liquid particles. And they're going to be the ones to evaporate first. So once those particles escape into the gas phase, those slower moving particles are still sitting in the puddle. So how do the rest of them evaporate as well? Well, the floor underneath that puddle will give the liquid particles a little bit more molecular motion. Because when those fast moving particles escape into the vapor phase, what's left in the puddle is kind of at a colder temperature. And so the floor underneath will transfer heat to the puddle and keep the puddle at 25 degrees Celsius. So the puddle will maintain a constant temperature. And there will always be fast moving particles in the puddle and slow moving particles in the puddle. And so that's how a liquid will eventually evaporate. When liquids evaporate, they have what's called a vapor pressure. And this is basically the pressure exerted by those molecules that are escaping into the vapor phase. Now to better understand vapor pressure, let's first take a look at a couple of important points regarding evaporation. And the first one is that evaporation occurs at the surface. Now, only these particles up here at the surface are the ones evaporating. Those in the bulk liquid phase are not doing that. The second is that we know evaporation occurs at any temperature. Even cold liquids have a distribution of molecular velocities, and there will always be a certain portion of molecules that have sufficient thermal energy of motion to break free and escape into the vapor phase. Now to really understand what vapor pressure is and how it works, we're going to do what's called a thought experiment. And a thought experiment is a tool used by scientists to really think their way through how a certain phenomena works. And scientists use them from time to time. In fact, Einstein used thought experiments. He sort of popularized them when he was trying to understand how certain difficult concepts in special relativity worked. Well, the thought experiment that we're going to use to better understand vapor pressure is to pour water into a flask and cork it. And what we mean is that we're going to imagine that we pour water into a flask and cork it, and we're going to sort of think our way through what happens. And here is our flask, and there is the water that we've poured into our flask, and there is the cork. 
Now we'll make an assumption that the flask is surrounded by a vacuum, meaning there's no air in the region around the flask and there's also no air inside the flask. The only material in the flask is the water. Now because water evaporates, some of these liquid molecules will begin to escape into the vapor phase. And there is a certain speed at which that happens. And the rate at which molecules vaporize depends on the temperature and also on the surface area of water. So we would acknowledge that there is a certain rate of vaporization. And if we wait a little while, some of the molecules have now escaped into the vapor phase. And there they are, just a few of them. Now, those molecules up here in the vapor phase are colliding with each other and with the walls of the container. And as a result of those collisions, some of the molecules may lose their molecular motion and get trapped back into the liquid phase. And so there begins to form a certain counteracting rate of condensation. But the rate of vaporization is still much greater than that counteracting rate of condensation. So the amount of particles up here in the vapor phase will continue to increase. But if you wait long enough, there will end up being a certain amount up here in the vapor phase where the rate of condensation is now equal to the rate of vaporization. In other words, because vaporization occurs greater than the rate of condensation back here, the molecules up here in the vapor phase will continue to increase and the more molecules in the vapor phase, the greater the rate of condensation. So there will eventually be that point at which the two rates are now equal. The two processes of vaporizing and condensation are occurring at equal rates. And when that happens, water is being vaporized as fast as it's condensing. And so you've reached this point of equilibrium. And the partial pressure of water when this happens is called the vapor pressure. Now this is a point of equilibrium and we say that it's really a dynamic equilibrium because although the amount of water vapor and liquid water is remaining relatively constant, there are still molecules being vaporized and molecules condensing. And so it's a dynamic sort of equilibrium. Now we'll come across other cases of dynamic equilibrium. In fact, quite a few of them in our course. This is the first one. Now, what would happen if we uncork this flask? Would there still be a vapor pressure? If we uncork this flask, wouldn't the molecules escape and the vapor pressure would be gone? Well, the answer is that there would be a vapor pressure. It doesn't matter if the cork is there or not, water would still exhibit that vapor pressure. So let's see how this works. Now here is an unsealed container. Now, vaporization is really a local phenomenon. You see, right around the surface at which vaporization occurs, these molecules that have just vaporized right next to the surface, they don't know that the lid is gone. They don't know that the other molecules way ahead of them are escaping. In fact, the concentration of water right here above the surface of the liquid is pretty much the same as the concentration of water right above the liquid in the sealed container. And so right around the surface, the process of vaporization and condensation is the same over there, and it's also the same over here. You see, because it's a local phenomenon, it doesn't really matter that there's a, a lid or no lid. So yes, unsealed containers still exhibit vapor pressure. And at 25 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure 
exhibited by water is about 24 torr, or you remember one torr is one millimeter of mercury, so 24 millimeters of mercury. Now what would happen if we were to increase the heat or increase the temperature of this water? Well, when you increase the temperature, you're giving the liquid more thermal energy and a larger fraction of these molecules will be able to vaporize and so the rate of vaporization will now become greater and that means a corresponding increase in the vapor pressure. And at 50 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 92.3 torr. So as the temperature increases, so does the vapor pressure. But the relationship between temperature and vapor pressure is not a linear relationship. It is, in fact, an exponential relationship, which is described by the Clapeyron equation. This equation describes how the vapor pressure changes with the temperature. And we see that by the equation, the vapor pressure is equal to a constant times E raised to the negative delta H of vaporization divided by RT. R is the gas constant. So because this is a negative exponent, whatever is in the numerator of that exponent, if that becomes bigger, the vapor pressure would become smaller. So as the enthalpy of vaporization becomes bigger, that means the vapor pressure would become smaller. Does that make sense? You remember the enthalpy of vaporization is the amount of energy that it costs to vaporize water? Well, if it costs a lot of energy to vaporize water, it's not going to be vaporizing that much, and the vapor pressure would be smaller. So those substances that have large enthalpies of vaporization have corresponding small vapor pressures. Now temperature is in the denominator of this negative exponent, so the larger the temperature, the larger the vapor pressure. And that is what we described down here. So larger enthalpies of vaporization means smaller vapor pressures, and larger temperatures mean larger vapor pressures. And if you plot vapor pressure versus temperature, you end up with this curved exponential plot. Here you can see two substances' vapor pressures changing with temperature. The first is acetone, and the other one is water. What you should recognize in this plot is that at any given temperature, acetone always has a larger vapor pressure than water. You remember water has those strong hydrogen bonds, and it takes a lot of energy to vaporize water. It has a large delta H of vaporization, and so water is going to have a relatively low vapor pressure compared to most other substances. As the temperature of a substance increases, so does its vapor pressure. Now the Clapeyron equation tells us the relationship between the two is an exponential one. And so what we ought to see is that as the temperature of a substance increases, its vapor pressure should really spike up. The following shows experimental vapor pressure data for water, and we do see that when the temperature increases, its vapor pressure begins to increase faster and faster. Now a couple of points are outlined right here. This one is the room temperature of 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius, and we see that the vapor pressure at room temperature is 24 torr. And down here, this is the boiling temperature of water, 373 Kelvin or 100 degrees Celsius, and it has a vapor pressure at that temperature of 760 torr. I hope this pressure is causing some alarms to go off, because that is, in fact, the atmospheric pressure at sea level. And that's no coincidence. Water boils when its vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure.
So when the temperature of water is increased so that its vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, that's when water begins to boil. Now I think we'll better understand this if we take a closer look at the difference between vaporization or vapor pressure at room temperature versus at the boiling temperature. Here are two containers of water. One is at room temperature and the other at the boiling temperature. Now room temperature water only exhibits a vapor pressure of 24 torr and that's much less than the 760 torr of the atmosphere. And vaporization is only going to occur at the surface. But when the temperature of water is increased up to 100 degrees Celsius or 373 Kelvin, its vapor pressure is now equal and pushing in the opposite direction of the atmosphere. And as a result, vaporization not only occurs at the surface, but also all throughout the liquid. And that's what these bubbles are. They're water being vaporized throughout the bulk liquid phase. Now that is only going to occur at the boiling temperature. In fact, since the vapor pressure is of equal strength as the atmosphere, water vapor is kind of pressing out. It has the strength to form these bubbles. And that's not going to happen at room temperature. And you can sort of imagine that at room temperature, if one of these bubbles were to try to form, the overpowering atmospheric pressure would collapse that bubble before it even forms. And so vaporization below the boiling temperature only occurs at the surface, but at the boiling temperature, it occurs everywhere. Now, that's at an atmospheric pressure of 760 torr we know that at the top of some tall mountains, the atmospheric pressure is much less than 760 torr. And that's because there is not as much atmospheric weight above the top of a mountain as there is at the bottom of a mountain. In fact, here in Hawaii, some of the tallest mountains have an atmospheric pressure much less than 760 torr. And so water would end up boiling at a much lower temperature. Uh, the tallest mountain here in Hawaii is Mauna Kea. And Mauna is the Hawaiian word for mountain, so Mauna Kea means Mount Kea. And Mauna Kea has an elevation of close to 14,000 feet, which is pretty tall. In fact, if you were to see Mauna Kea from the bottom of the ocean all the way to the top of a mountain. It's taller than Mount Everest. But from sea level up to the top of the mountain, it's about 14,000 feet. Now the Clapeyron equation describes the exponential relationship between temperature and vapor pressure. And so if we plot these two against each other, we should see that vapor pressure begin to spike up and that's exactly what it does. Now, when the vapor pressure reaches the 760 torr, we call that the normal boiling temperature. So that's the normal boiling point of water. But the Clapeyron equation can also be arra arranged into another useful form. If you take the natural log of both sides of this equation, you can rearrange the Clapeyron equation into the following form. The natural log of the vapor pressure equals the negative delta H of vaporization divided by R times the inverse temperature plus the natural log of the constant beta. And this is a Y equals MX plus B type of equation, or the equation of a line. And so what we should be able to do is to plot not pressure, but natural log of the vapor pressure versus one over the temperature. And we should get a straight line. And that's exactly what we see when we take the natural log in the inverse temperature of the preceding data.
plotting the natural log of the pressure versus the inverse temperature, we do get that straight line. And with the help of a computer, we can calculate the linear least square regression line or best fit line through that data. And it will give us the slope in the y-intercept. Now we know that this slope of negative 5190.2 should be equal to the negative delta H of vaporization over R. And so if we set those two equal to each other, we can solve for the delta H of vaporization, and that ends up being 43,151 joules per mole, or 43.15 kilojoules per mole. And that's close to the reported book value of 40.7 kilojoules per mole. So the Clapeyron equation gave us a pretty accurate value of the heat of vaporization of water. Now, this equation can also be used to calculate the boiling temperature at the top of Mauna Kea. You see, what we can do is take the atmospheric pressure at the top of Mauna Kea, which is much less than 760. It's 450 torr. And so if we take our 450 torr and we plug it into this equation right here, in fact, y would be equal to natural log of 450 torr, and we solve for the temperature, which is 1 over x, we would end up getting the temperature equals 354.3 Kelvin, and that's 81.3 degrees Celsius. So water at the top of Mauna Kea will boil right above 80 degrees Celsius. So all of those scientists up there in their observatories studying the stars will probably need to boil their eggs much longer than down at the bottom of the mountain. So I hope you understand a little bit more about vapor pressure and vaporization than you did before. In our next lecture, we're going to take a look at all three phases of matter in the form of phase diagrams. And these are nice graphical representations of the different phases that a substance will take under different conditions. So I hope you join me for that.